So, you've recently made a switch to Linux, or you're at least you're thinking about it. Good for you, it's a good jump to make. If there's ever been a time to switch your main computer experience to an open source Linux desktop alternative, uh, 2021 would be the year to do it. Sorry if you're watching from another year. But there comes a point in time where you realize the rest of the world doesn't run Linux and most of them aren't interested. So that means you've got to integrate with an ecosystem of one or another. So today's video is a one of a two part series of integrating with other ecosystems in Linux. Whether we like it or not, school, our workplace, whatever it is, usually are deeply entrenched in either Apple's, Google's or Microsoft's ecosystem. Sometimes a combination of all three. So today's video part one is the ecosystem that in my mind is one of the trickiest to get right uh, when it comes to integrating a Linux operating system. In this case, for this example, I'm gonna be using Zorin OS 16 because I think it's a example of a great Windows alternative. Uh, and I'll be showing how I, or some of the tips and tricks that I've picked up of how to integrate into a Microsoft ecosystem. This is, should be an interesting one. Drop a like if this is helpful for you and definitely let me know down below what ecosystem you have to contend with, which ones are the trickiest in desktop Linux and subscribe if you're new. Come on board for the ride. Let's see what we can find out. Before we get going, today's episode was brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare, for those who are unfamiliar, is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creatives, productivists, developers, or really anyone who's wanting to learn something new. Now, whether you're looking to upskill or you're pursuing a new hobby or starting a bit of a side hustle, Skillshare has got courses that can help you meet your goals uh, with a bunch of them on a range of interests from business and design and art and music and DevOps and so much more. And what I really like about it is that courses are often in very short digestible chunks and many of them can be accomplished in like an hour. So I never really feel like my time is being wasted while I'm learning. Uh, for example, this course on real productivity, building habits that last by Thomas Frank has been uh, great for helping me build systems that encourage consistent productive work and because Skillshare being a community, you get other people's feedback and insights as they've been doing the course, as well as recommendations once you're done for other courses that might be in your interest area. So head down to the description and the first 1000 people who click on the link below will get a one month free trial to Skillshare Premium. No ads, unlimited access, original and consistently updated content. Seriously, what's not to love? So check out the link in below and thanks to Skillshare for making today's video possible. Okay, so there's a bunch of things that I do wanna talk about in this video. I've gotta try and keep this as brief and snappy as possible. So definitely check out the time codes in the playback bar below and also in the description to jump to the area that's of most interest to you. The good news is, is that it is actually a lot easier than it used to be. So the first thing that I want to uh, tackle or try to tackle is cloud storage because that's kind of the backbone of all of it nowadays. Now, once upon a time, OneDrive used to be incredibly difficult to get working in Linux uh, to the same feature parity of what most people enjoyed on Windows and even on Mac. Well, nowadays that's not entirely true. You can get OneDrive working quite nicely for you through the excellent work of a brown egg. I'm not really sure how to uh, say that apart from a brown egg. Um, and so you can see the feature list here, getting this up and running is actually pretty impressive. Now the downside to this particular solution is that uh, yes, it does involve using the command line. Uh, so you gotta be prepared for that. But apart from that, it is fairly straightforward to uh, to log in, get set up, and get the same sort of features that you'd expect from OneDrive on Mac or Windows, including real-time monitoring, uh, synchronizing files both ways, uh, SharePoint and Office 365 um, shared libraries. This is a big deal for a lot of uh, education or business place. Uh, or business setups of uh, Office 365, being able to integrate in with that. And uh, yeah, and a few other things. So once you have OneDrive uh, working in the background, you can set it up as something that uh, boots up with your system. They've got some uh, installation instructions here for all the different versions of Linux that there is, uh, including some ARM builds, which is fun to see. Uh, this is a pretty uh, frequently updated project. Um, they do have scripts to handle most of the heavy lifting to get it set up. 
but it is important just to keep it in mind that this is running primarily on the command line and you can set it up to run in the background so that uh, you don't have to worry about it ever again. It's very, very handy. Now, that might sound a little bit ad hoc to you. And so that's why the second suggestion is to go with a third party sync client. Now, I've looked into these in the past and once upon a time, these were a little bit janky in and of themselves. Whereas nowadays, I think there's two very real options that you could go uh, and investigate for yourself. Now, the reason why I suggest the OneDrive from a brown egg first up is because of the fact that it is open source and it's freely available in every sense of the word. Whereas in sync and the second suggestion, expand drive are both third party Party clients that you do actually need to pay for some features. Uh, so it's important to realize that as these are third party um, pieces of software that are available on other platforms as well, they do have a very compelling feature lists, but it is worth uh, keeping in mind that you will need to pay for them at some point. With uh, InSync, InSync uses a, a file synchronization model and it does integrate really well with all of the GTK base um, on uh, Gnome, Mate and Cinnamon respectively. And, uh, and the good news is, is that when you do deploy this, uh, it will actually do some extra fancy stuff. Like for example, if you have a bunch of Google Docs uh, sitting around in your Google Drive, as well as OneDrive or whatever other cloud provider you might be with, you can have one client that will manage it all for you, which is kind of handy. The particular downside for somebody like me who relies on having access to SharePoint and the rest of it is that uh, the SharePoint access can only come through uh, the company plan. So that is worth keeping in mind. Now, expand drive has a slightly different way that it functions in that you can connect to all of uh, these cloud providers uh, that are shown here. However, it more handles uh, file syncing like a network drive in that it will mount the, it will mount the network drive here in your uh, file explorer, like a network drive, which is good for small files. But what I've noticed is that if you're dealing with anything larger than, you know, a couple of megs, there's a noticeable uh, hiccup or a bit of a lag when you go to like open or preview that file, because it has to go get that file from the network drive that it's kind of mounted to the system. Uh, however, if you're only dealing with documents that might not be too big of a drawback for you. Okay, so moving on from that, it's time to now talk about how we're gonna handle Office documents. Um, the Linux and open source world have some great open source uh, Office solutions, uh, including LibreOffice would be chief among them. Uh, also only Office has fantastic uh, compatibility. There's WPS Office, there's, there's a myriad of Office suites available. However, the number one complaint that most people have about Office suites on Linux is compatibility. Compatibility with Microsoft Office files, presumably. So there's a few different angles that we can tackle this from in order to integrate better into a Microsoft ecosystem. First of all, uh, I would definitely suggest going and downloading uh, and installing the Microsoft Core fonts because uh, nine times out of 10 compatibility, at least in a visual sense and where fonts are spaced boils down to the fonts that were chosen. And if somebody was using Microsoft Office, they're going to be using the default fonts that are offered in Microsoft Word, which are the Windows Core fonts and also the Vista Core fonts. So when you're on Linux, it's a fairly straightforward affair, at least in most distributions uh, to look for the Microsoft Windows uh, True Type Core fonts. Now on Ubuntu based systems, in order to download download and install the, the Microsoft Core fonts, you'll be looking to do the classic sudo apt install ttf dash ms core fonts dash installer. And what that will do is uh, that will go out and basically it's a script that downloads uh, and extracts uh, various fonts from the PowerPoint preview uh, program from back in 2007. And it goes and grabs those and plugs them in uh, to your system and makes those fonts available. So, uh, and whether you're on a different distribution, you just follow the instructions uh, for whatever your distribution of choice is. And of course, if you're on Arch, there's probably an AUR uh, package out there with commonly updated Windows fonts. Now, that only covers the ones that you can see on the screen here. By the way, I'll be linking to this blog post from Need for Bits down in the description if you wanna follow along with these instructions, as I would suggest, especially for this bit. You wanna be able to install Microsoft 
Microsoft's clear type fonts, which, uh, which came along with Windows Vista, um, but they've been used extensively throughout Microsoft's ecosystem. In, uh, it shows up everywhere in their online Word and uh, OneNote apps. It shows up in their email formatting. It shows up in uh, default fonts in documents. And so these fonts are the ones that uh, really trip a lot of people up. And they're quite a handful to install uh, if you hadn't found this script. Um, because you do actually have to go out, extract these fonts from random places, and then manually copy them into your system, which is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, however, this very helpful uh, blog post has got a link to a wgit file uh, where basically they just have a collection of these fonts that you can uh, download and install. Now they're not going to appear exactly the same as they do on Windows because of the fact that uh, the way that those fonts are rendered are very is very unique to Windows. However, they will look a lot closer than what the stand-in replacements for those fonts look like. Okay, so uh, let's talk briefly about Office Suites uh, because while we do have excellent open source Office Suites, a lot of the time we are forced to uh, open up a Word file that has very fiddly formatting in Word itself. It's just way easier to use the online apps. Now, to that end, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be kind of playing the devil's advocate here and recommending that if you're going to be using some of Microsoft services and stuff like that commonly, then I would suggest, I know people are going to kill me for this, but go and grab the, the beta version of Microsoft Edge. The reason being is because Edge has a unique uh, feature to it, or at least the implementation is simple and unique of adding web apps that run through Microsoft Edge and, uh, and can get you up and running pretty quickly. So let's say, for example, uh, I'm gonna jump into Word here. It's gonna ask me to log into my Microsoft account, so I'll do that very quickly. Now, both the beauty and the curse of the Microsoft ecosystem is that if you have OneDrive set up natively on your system, then all of the files that you have been changing and modifying on your system will also be synced to OneDrive here in the cloud. So when it comes to opening, let's say, a Word doc, for example, you should be able to open it pretty quickly from the recently used uh, files, or you can simply navigate to it in OneDrive. Again, the benefits of an ecosystem, am I right? Now, when you actually launch Word itself, what you can do is uh, you can actually very easily add uh, Word, OneNote, etc., etc., as web apps to your Linux menu so that they show up as apps and kind of look and run as app-ish as you can get. Uh, now, there used to be a lot of Snap packages in the Snap Store that would do this. Um, you could go and install a, a, a little collection of Microsoft web apps that were basically uh, this web version of Word and PowerPoint, OneNote, etc., all wrapped up in Electron wrappers. Nowadays, I kind of don't think it's all that necessary um, because you can simply come down to apps and then say, install this site as an app. And then you can give it a name. Uh, so you could just say Word online, say, go for it and it'll open it up in a uh, in a minimal window and now that uh, that icon will be available for you to install and launch from your menu under edge apps now again there are other ways of going about this and there are other web browsers that allow you to do this but having one that is kind of built and endorsed and blessed by microsoft as it were um, i think will pay dividends in the future obviously you've got to be okay with using Edge as a browser. So take that for what it is. Also, I want to mention another ace in the hole for integrating in Microsoft's ecosystem recently has been uh, the addition of Microsoft Teams uh, integrated into the Linux desktop. Now, while I think it might still be in preview, um, the both the Debian RPM version and also there's obviously a snap package and I think there might even be a flat pack uh, available by now. Uh, for Microsoft Teams integrates a lot of the extra stuff that you'd expect from Microsoft into the desktop. So when it comes to integrating into your workplace, uh, whatever communication systems they might be using through Microsoft Teams, or even embedding things like uh, OneNote or other apps and services from Microsoft, Teams kind of acts as a bit of a hub for that. And so having a native Linux version that is effectively, it's an Electron app, but still it's an officially supported uh, app from Microsoft is uh, very useful for integrating into 
into uh, a Microsoft ecosystem, at least for communications. And that brings us to the final stretch, which is uh, email and calendar. Um, these are kind of the uh, low hanging fruit, I guess, that I was gonna save till last. And then I'll do a quick bonus tip at the end that might be applicable to some people, but not to everyone. And that is that, uh, when it comes to email clients, I've got two recommendations. Uh, if you are uh, heavily invested in the GNOME ecosystem, you like running the GNOME desktop, then using Evolution is a pretty good uh, email client that also understands uh, calendar and other things from a Microsoft account and even an Office 365 or Exchange or SharePoint sort of situation. Uh, through the default client that comes on a lot of GNOME based distributions. Now, the key to making all of this work is that uh, because I've had it work in the past uh, by default on some distros and then other distros like Fedora leave this uh, extra little bit of source out and that is the Evolution EWS package. And basically that, ex uh, that is like an exchange backend uh, plugin that allows Evolution to talk to Office 365 slash Exchange servers and synchronize your mail and calendar and those other things. Now, it's also worth mentioning that uh, the GNOME team does a pretty bang up job of making a lot of these uh, online settings available in the online accounts section. You can actually add an Exchange or an Office 365 account in to GNOME itself and it will integrate in then with Evolution and it will also try and integrate in with the calendar app which is kind of handy. And I think KDE, uh, it's been a little while since I tried integrating it on KDE, but I believe their, uh, their KDE personal management, uh, personal info management suite is getting better in this regard. Uh, but Kmail was still a bit clunky the last time I tried it. Now, my other recommendation that I've given before in other app recommendation lists is to try out Mailspring, as this has been something that I've uh, noticed works really, really well as a modern email client. And I, I think it gets a lot closer to the feature parity that we expect from, you know, an Outlook-ish email client. Um, it, for, at least for professional email management, I think it gives uh, the user a lot more um, modern feature set compared to uh, what's available in uh, compared to what's available in Evolution. Uh, now, if you do want uh, Electron wrappers for some of these, you can go searching through the uh, Electron JS database, or you could have a look through the Snap Store or FlatHub for Electron wrappers for things like OneNote and those other Office apps. But what I've noticed is, is that they're often uh, easy come, easy go, and they'll uh, appear and disappear overnight. With the exception of P3X OneNote, this one's been around for a long, long time, and I've used it several times, and uh, it is available as a self-updating app image uh, on Debs, RPMs, and, uh, and even ARM compatibility there, which is kind of nice. But there's two things that I want to quickly unpack right here at the end, and that is uh, when it comes to shared uh, Windows network shares, and also when it comes to uh, cloud syncing through a third party. And this isn't relevant to everyone, so I've left it here to the, towards the end. Thank you for watching if you've made it this far, and I'll see you in the next video. But just at the end here, the uh, what I've noticed is that the performance of Windows network shares on Linux is not quite up to the same standard as what it is on Windows. And now there's all kinds of suggestions out there online about how to speed this up. And most modern network infrastructure uh, usually is geared towards the more OneDrive slash SharePoint setup anyway. So cloud storage has kind of rendered a lot of local network shares, mostly irrelevant when it comes to office productivity. But that's not to say that uh, there are plenty of network shares out there. Connecting to network shares is not usually an issue in Linux. It is getting the same performance as you would under Windows or even Mac that becomes the issue. Uh, so the, uh, it's beyond the scope of this video, but it's worth mentioning. The final thing I wanted to mention was the fact that uh, for my personal um, setup, what I actually use is uh, the Synology drive, which is tied to a local uh, local network NAS that I have uh, set up and running in the background. And what it does is I've actually set that up to synchronize with my OneDrive account, basically whenever changes are made. So what happens is, is that once you connect through the Synology NAS, once you connect your OneDrive to Synology Drive, Synology Drive will keep uh, checking with OneDrive and keep reflecting changes back to OneDrive and then sync those files locally into uh, my file browser uh, here in the Linux desktop. Now, what I love about this is it gives me the same level of access and features that I would expect from a native file syncing service uh, without me having to pay 
extra quote unquote for it. Um, I'll link to another video about the Synology NAS uh, in the description below. It's a very unique setup for me. And so while it works flawlessly for me personally, I love having uh, this setup the way it is. It's definitely not gonna work for everyone because it actually involves you going out and spending some decent money on getting a NAS, um, but it's just worth throwing out there. All right, thank you so much for watching. Hope it helps. We'll see you in the next video.